Hello everybody and welcome to the first of the Registrar case series. This is something I've been planning for a while and I can't wait to share with you all on the channel. We've got residents and registrars from all over the world bringing cases that they've come across, that they've learned things from and sharing it with us on the channel here. And after they've shared the case, I'm going to be sharing a couple of notes from the case that I've put together about each individual case. Now kicking us off today, we've got Dr. Eduardo Gomez coming all the way from Spain. Very brave, the first person to actually come back to me and share a case, and I'm really grateful for him for doing so. So if you enjoy this case, if you learn something from the case, please leave a comment below thanking Dr. Gomez or follow him on Twitter, send him a message there thanking him for this case. It's a great case. I'd encourage you to pause the video before he gets into describing the case and look at this contrasted CT scan, this T1 weighted MRI, the flare and the DWI, and try and come up with a differential diagnosis for yourself, then after this I'm going to be sharing with you a six-step approach to a focal brain lesion, some of the things that you need to be thinking about when you see a focal mass within the brain. So without further ado, let's hand it over to Dr. Gomez and I'll see you all after the case. Hello everybody, I am Eduardo Gomez. I work in Miguel Cervet Hospital in Zaragoza in Spain. Thank you very much, Michael, for doing these cases, and I hope you all find this interesting and you like it. This is going to be a neuroradiology case, and this is a 60-year-old man with no previous illness of interest that presented to the emergency room with dizziness during the last 48 hours with sudden movements. His family also reported behavior disorders at home and at work, during the last weeks. He had no fever and no other symptom of interest. A CT scan of the brain was ordered and we can see a right parietal low mass, 45 millimeters of diameter, with irregular margins and predominantly hippointens. After this, we decided to add contrast and we could see a peripheral enhancement that has a ring shape and also basogenic edema around the lesion. It caused a little mass effect with stretch of some sulci, but middle line is centered and the ventricular system wasn't compromised. After this finding, some days later, an EMA was made and the sequences we decided to do were a T1 3D with contrast to measure properly the lesion, axial DP, coronal T2, diffusion, perfusion, and fever tractography. And we can see a polylabial mass in the right parietal lobe with solid and cystic component with peripheral contrast enhancement and predominantly in the lateral posterior side which corresponds to the solid area. We can see the basogenic edema of the white matter better in FLIR. It is better seen in that sequence. Also, in diffusion-weighted imaging, we can see just a very little restriction to diffusion, not very much restriction. In the perfusion sequence, we can see an increase in the cerebral blood volume up to 10 times compared to the normal contralateral white matter. So that's, that's very much, there's a very big increase of cerebra cerebral blood volume of that lesion. Perfusion data from the adjacent nodule had also an increase of three times. And finally, as an incidental finding, we can see better in the DEP image a uh, left maxillary sinusitis. Tractography was also made to help to help neural surgeons in a future resection. And as we can see, this um, image that they are very helpful for them. Um, a CT scan of the whole body was also made and we, can see, we couldn't see any evidence of any tumor. So with all this data, um, it was thought to be a high-grade primary tumor of the brain rather than a metastasis. And that that was confirmed by the pathologist after the resection of the tumor was made by the surgeons. And I also bring this other lesion just to do a differential diagnosis. 
This is a left frontal lobe mass, very quite similar to the previous that we have seen. Also peripheral enhancement, but um, if we investigate um, the previous thorax ray, if we see it, uh, so we can see there is a nodule in the left upper lobe, so this is more likely to be a metastasis, as it was later confirmed. Also, there is a um, little different. We can see a vividly bit increased in cerebral blood volume in the region of the lesion, but there is a different with the high-grade tumor, primary tumor of the brain. In the graphics of perfusion, there is a decreased in signal in both cases, but in metastasis it takes so much time to get back to normal, which is a different with the high-grade tumor, which also have a it decreases in the signal very much, but it have it has a very it comes back to normal much faster. In metastasis, it takes um, a little bit longer to go back to normal. So this is just the case. It's a quick case. I hope you liked it. It's quite common case in neuroradiology, a high high grade tumor of the brain versus metastasis. And um, that's all. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's the case. It's a great case for learning, a great case for building an approach to focal brain lesions. And so many good images shared there by Dr. Gomez. So I'm really grateful for him for sharing these images with us. Now I'm going to share with you six steps that you can follow when faced with a focal brain lesion to hopefully help you tease out some of those differential diagnoses. Now when we're faced with one of these lesions, we're generally trying to think, is this a primary brain tumor? Is this a metastasis that is seeded within the brain? Or are we dealing with a cerebral abscess? All of these can look very similar when dealing with a focal brain lesion. And in the back of our mind, we also need to be thinking of, is this an infarct with hemorrhage? Now these are the six steps that we can follow and I'm going to go through these one by one. I know it looks very busy, but we can sequentially go through these and I'd encourage you to go through these points in this order when facing a focal brain lesion. The first thing you need to decide as a good radiologist is, is this patient safe? When you're looking at an image, you need to remember there's a patient behind this image and is there any urgent information that we need to share with the referring clinician before we go ahead and make our formal report? And generally, when we're dealing with a focal mass, there are three things that we worry about. Is there any bleeding in the mass or any hemorrhage? Is there a hydrocephalus or is there any mass effect and herniation? All of these are emergencies and need to be reported back to the referring clinician. Now, if we see hemorrhage, we can think of primary tumors that cause hemorrhage, the most common being a glioblastoma. Then metastases coming to the brain, the ones that commonly bleed are melanomas, renal cell carcinomas, thyroid carcinomas, and choriocarcinomas. Now, lung and breast cancers don't often bleed, but a small subsection of them will. And because they are the most common metastases, we can't rule them out of our differential. If we see a bleeding mass within the brain, we can't confidently say this is not lung or breast because of those absolute numbers. Large numbers of metastases are lung and breast, and a small percentage of those will bleed. The second thing we need to decide is, is this an intraaxial mass or an extraaxial mass? And it can often be quite difficult to tell, especially in peripheral tumors, kind of like the one we saw now. Now, extraaxial masses push brain contents towards the midline. Round an extraaxial mass, if we see gray matter lining that extraaxial mass, separating the mass from the white matter, it's very likely to be an extraaxial mass. The same goes if there's CSF around that mass. If there's a CSF cleft, this is probably an extraaxial mass that is pushing intracranially. We can also have specific features like a dural tail in a meningioma, which is an extraaxial mass. We see that mass spreading into the dura. Now, those are some of the signs that can help us differentiate whether this mass is intraaxial or extraaxial. Knowing the location of the mass, where exactly it is, can greatly help us narrow down our differential. Is the mass abutting the ventricles? Is it in the pineal region? Is it in the CP angle or the pituitary region? Is it in the cavernous sinus? Is the mass between the gray white matter junction? That's a common place for metastases. Where exactly the mass is can really narrow down our differential. Then we want to look at the enhancement patterns and the diffusion patterns of that mass. 
Now, when we're looking at metastases, by definition, they will always enhance. A metastasis that arrives in the brain needs to create new blood vessels, and that neovascularization occurs without a solid blood-brain barrier. So contrast will always cross that barrier and will always enhance that mass. Now, primary brain lesions can have variable enhancement, and the degree of enhancement doesn't correlate to the grade of the tumor. We can get high-grade tumors that have very little enhancement and low-grade tumors that have a lot of enhancement and vice versa. Abscesses will generally enhance. The periphery of the abscess has got a lot of inflammatory cells. It's got a blood supply there that will cause enhancement. The center of the abscess is necrotic. There won't be blood flow to the center of the abscess. We will have a dark region. We won't get enhancement centrally in an abscess. That's why antibiotics or antimicrobials don't work well in an abscess, we need to actually manually evacuate that abscess because there's no good blood supply to that central necrotic region. So as you can see, all three differentials that we're trying to differentiate between can all enhance to varying different degrees. Now what separates the diagnosis in this case quite well is the DWI image. In our case that we were looking at now, there was no restriction to diffusion. It was dark in the DWI image. Now an abscess, as we've just been describing, is necrotic in the center. It's highly cellular. There's, there will be some restriction to diffusion there. And you would expect the center of an abscess on a DWI image to be bright. You would expect restricted diffusion in that abscess. In our case, we've got a cystic component that is filled with fluid that has very little restriction to diffusion. And that helps us separate this case from an abscess versus a metastasis or a primary brain tumor. Now, I asked many people what they thought this case was on Instagram earlier today, and about half of the responses were saying cerebral abscess. So this is perhaps a really good learning point that on our DWI, we would expect restricted diffusion within an abscess. Then one of the most helpful things we can do is differentiate whether this is a solitary mass or there are multiple masses within the brain. Now when we're dealing with multiple masses, the likelihood of a primary brain tumor drastically decreases. We're probably now dealing with a metastasis or we're dealing with multiple septic emboli causing multiple abscesses. Now when we see a solitary lesion, it becomes a little bit more difficult to differentiate. A third of all metastases will present as a solitary lesion within the brain. And if a patient has a primary, a known primary elsewhere, and they have a solitary brain lesion, more than 90% of those will represent a metastasis from that primary lesion. So having a solitary lesion in the brain doesn't exclude metastases, but having multiple lesions drastically decreases the likelihood of a primary brain tumor. And the last thing we want to look at is, are there any distinctive MRI features? For the most part, most focal brain lesions will be T2 hyperintense and T1 hypointense. And there are a couple of exceptions to this rule that can help us narrow down our differential. There are certain lesions which are T2 hypointense. Any lesion that is containing mucin can have a variable degree of T2 hypointensity. So we're generally thinking of gastrointestinal adenocarcinomas here. And if we have a T2 hypointense lesion, we also need to think about hypercellular tumors, lymphomas, medulloblastomas, germinomas. Those can all be T2 hypointense. Then we can look at lesions that are T1 hyperintense. Any melanin-containing tumor will be T1 hyperintense. So melanomas we're thinking there. Tissues that contain fat, dermoids, teratomas, will also have a T1 hyperintense signal to the surrounding tissue. And then any lesion that can bleed, so we've mentioned these, your melanomas, your renal cell carcinomas, thyroid carcinomas, or choriocarcinomas, if any of those bleed, they can be T1 hyperintense. So you can see none of these directly will give us a specific diagnosis, but a combination of these six points can really help us narrow down what the differential is. Now importantly, you're not always going to be able to tell what exactly the tumor is. And increasingly, the classification of brain tumors is more and more immunohistochemical and genetic testing, less based on the actual imaging findings. What we want to do is try and confidently classify whether this is a metastasis, whether it's a primary brain tumor, or are we dealing with an infarct and hemorrhage or a cerebral abscess. And going through these six points can really help us to differentiate those.
So in this case, as Dr. Gomez said, the diagnosis was a high-grade primary brain tumor. It had that solid component with that cystic extension anteriorly. And in fact, it was a glioblastoma, an IDH wild-type glioblastoma, which is now under a separate classification from the IDH mutant astrocytomas. And that differentiation in classification since the 2021 Blue Book has come out is a topic for another talk that I'm sure we'll go over in the future. So I hope these notes helped. And again, thank you, Dr. Gomez, for sharing such a great case, such great images. We can really learn a lot from this case. Send him some love in the comments below. It's really difficult to put yourself out there, video yourself and share it with a large audience like this. And I really am grateful. Now, with that being said, if you want to share a case, if you've got a good case that you feel like people could learn from, please contact me via email. I've linked my email below. So until the next case, I hope you've enjoyed it. Goodbye, everybody.